Hi everyone. Um, so the topic of my presentation today is cross-cultural echoes of silence and the philological study of desert silence in Baltimore, Salamanca, and Beijing. So entering into the 21st century, um, the other language has a had a transformation from the lingua franca um, on Europe, East European Jews to a language spoken mostly by the Orthodox communities. And I thought it would be um, very interesting and valuable to look at the Yiddish education, acquisition, and expression in different communities under different political, ethnical, and cultural landscapes. So my research uh, is, um, primarily explores the silence and uh, not only the silence, but also the voice of the Yiddish language and culture in these different um, cities. And uh, it will be primarily uh, about my uh, personal experience and thoughts and ideas while looking for traits for Yiddish in these cities. And um, here, silence represents not only the use or the uh, learning process of the language, but also the social norms, values, and expression of identity. And I really hope that the study could offer some new perspectives on how silence shapes and is shaped by the collective memory and identity of the Yiddish speaking populations. Um, and um, yeah, uh, um, through the comparative study of silence and voice of Yiddish in three different urban settings, I want to kind of compare the how the existence or non-existence of Yiddish language and culture, and to further um, think about the role of silence in maintaining the Yiddish identity amidst the global diaspora in different uh, under different um, historical and social cultural contexts. So the reason why I chose um, these three cities in three different continents in North America, Europe, and Asia with very different historical background relationship and, and dynamics is because of my actually because of my personal connection with um, with the three cities. And um, I currently study in Johns Hopkins University um, in my second undergraduate year in Baltimore. And I find myself um, really closely connected with the city um, when I, because um, I sometimes run through the city and sometimes I notice synagogues on the side of the road. And that really made me think about um, this. And um, I'm t also taking um, intermediate Yiddish too at, um, at the university in the uh, in the Johns Hopkins Hill, the Small Clerk Center for Jewish Life. And as for Beijing, uh, I was my hometown where I grew up until I was 14. So I also knew the city pretty well. And I still go back there uh, during my vacations. And this winter, uh, last, last winter, um, I went to Salamanca for the Johns Hopkins Intercession Program. Um, uh, and I lived there for a month with a Spanish family. Um, so I had, like, before going there, I had the idea on my mind to um, kind of, like, explore the, because it was, uh, all the three cities was, were um, completely different. And so I thought about, it would be interesting for me to explore the Yiddish, whether there are Yiddish community and history and um, cultural expression um, to compare them and contrast. So I'll, uh, I'll be approaching this research from an anthropological perspective, because I thought it would be an interesting angle to see this not from like a broader or general view, like historical or social lens, but also to see what the uh, ordinary, like what the individuals, uh, to find out about their perspective and ideas. So I engage with the community and the community members to understand their personal and the collective perception of silence in the community. And at the same time, I also did historical research and institutional analysis to look at whether there are Yiddish educational um, programs or community cultural events in the city. So I will um, juxtapose um, my findings across the three cities of the Yiddish expression with, within the um, three distinct cultures to identify patterns and, and divergence. So first, for Salamanca, I, I went there in um, December 2023. And on the right is a picture that I took um, at, at one night at, of the Plaza Mayor. And I felt like, uh, like at, at the other buildings in the old buildings in the university town, uh, really, they are really like the silent witness to uh, one thriving Jewish community in the town. So here, just to provide a little um, historical background, um, Jews in the town, they had civil rights in the um, 12th century, which actual, uh, was actually equal to these civil rights under the rule of Fernando II from 1157 to 1188. And uh, later in the 13th century, uh, they were actually granted a charter in Salamanca with full legal legal rights. So they even had like a certain level of self-governance, including uh, three synagogues in the city, which was quite uh, extraordinary because at the time, most uh, 
cities only had two uh, for the purpose. And, um, but uh, it all like, uh, uh, had a, like a decline in the 14th century because there were growing intolerance and restrictive laws. So uh, it kind of led to the final uh, forced conversions into Christians and also the eventual expulsion in 1492 which was unfortunate. And um, so the University of Solomon is essential in the city and it was also um, a witness to the expression of Jewish culture. Not necessarily yet, this was Jewish culture from the past. And uh, many uh, Jewish people used to teach at the university and they even had a Jewish study hall, although it was confisc confiscated uh, after the explosion. And Hebrew also used to be a, a very important part of the, uh, the university's curriculum. So, um, they they even had uh, they even st still preserve a uh, Torah school in the collection of books banned by the uh, by the institution, and this page shows a plaque on the wall of the Faculty of Mathematics in the university with Hebrew translation on the top. And this page shows the photo of the ban banned books from the library, and uh, right now there is a revival of Jewish community and culture in Spain, and many Ashkenazi Jews uh, who were primarily from the, uh, Latin America and Europe with uh, Europe origin have arrived in Spain over the last few decades. And uh, with the Federation of Jewish Community of Spain is the Spain, uh, Spanish affiliate of the World Jewish Congress. With um, Spain announcing that it would, uh, it would recognize the rights to citizenship of the descendants of Jews expelled from the country in the Middle East, uh, in the Middle Ages, sorry. <laughs> and many Ashkenazi Jews uh, were uh, also able to be recognized as descendants of those who like, were expelled in 1492. So um, I, it would be positive for the revival of the Yiddish language possibly in, in Spain and uh, in South America as well. And um, during my conversation uh, and uh, semi-structure interview with my host family mother, Soraya, and her son, I was able to see from both of the, um, the perspective from the older and the younger generation in Spain about their attitudes toward Jewish population and culture. And uh, although they were both very nice people, uh, the mother was a little more conservative on other topics like gender and politics in our daily conversations. But uh, it was actually very surprising to me that they both had very welcoming attitudes and even said that they wished that there were more different cultures in the town. And they were both happy that students of different backgrounds like me and my fellow classmates uh, from uh, Hopkins could come to visit and kind of uh, bring our uh, culture with us and, uh, and to um, uh, make the town more uh, vibrant. Also, uh, I, well, during my exploration, I went uh, into several supermarkets and mall and find that I could easily uh, find kosher food uh, with clear signs on the food. And um, besides that, I thought I focused on my experience while looking for signs of, uh, of the Yiddish language and culture. So uh, here's kind of something um, to feel notes I uh, wrote um, during the process. As a Chinese student with interest in Yiddish, my journey into the heart of Solomon was both a quest and a test for cultural curiosity. Walking through the Plaza Mayor, I was on the lookout for any signs of Yiddish, the sounds, the sights, or anything. Um, instead, I stumbled upon the enduring legacy of the Sephardic uh, support, uh, Jews, and it was everywhere in the uh, old stone walls of the university and the pink uh, etchings of Hebrew letters that seemed to carry stories from long ago. Solomon had greeted me with a different story um, compared to the one on my mind. The Hebrew inscriptions I found in the university were eloquent in their silence about Yiddish. They spoke of, uh, of a Jewish legacy, yes, but not the Ashkenazi culture that I was tracing. In this search, I learned that the absence actually speaks volume. The silence of Yiddish in Salamanca is a testament to its own narrative, a different journey of the diaspora and, and revival. It made, really made me think about the cultural resilience and how languages and cultures, much like people, can face the brink of extinction yet find new breath in the Bible. So now we um, move on to Baltimore, uh, which has a very rich history uh, and culture of Jewish communities ever since the 1800s. And, uh, so in the late uh, 19, I also kind of give a little um, uh, historical uh, uh, background. So uh, Baltimore uh, saw an influx of uh, Jewish immigrants in the late 19th and 20th century uh, who settled in neighborhoods like East Baltimore and spoke uh, Yiddish uh, in their daily lives. 
which was the essential part of the community. And as the community grew, so did the, the institutions. And today, uh, although uh, spoken Yiddish may not be as loud in the street, the legacy of uh, the legacy continues. And organizations and educational programs work to keep the language and cultures alive. So for me, uh, I attended a seminar in, uh, in Yiddish language and culture in my freshman year, um, two years ago, out of sheer curiosity. And it really opened a window into a cultural heritage of history, religion, philosophy, and art for me. And although I was one of the only three students in the Yiddish language class right now, I found that the stories, the poems, and the songs really resonated with me, which was the, uh, one of the reasons why I continued to uh, learn about uh, Yiddish and Jewish culture and language. And to me, here, uh, the uh, Yiddish community really transcends the cultural and race, racial boundaries and are really formed around more around shared interests and passions and uh, common feelings. And I could still remember um, the, uh, the songs that we learned. And the, oh, for, for one certain song that I could still remember today is the um, Her Her Nor Du Shein Made of Us, which, was, which I thought was uh, really beautiful. And I could like, um, I also, for, from the stories that we read in class, I could um, felt some similar um, morals and emotions from them. And here just uh, are just two like maps about of the hills and synagogues and Chabad in the city. And uh, turning our attention to Beijing, it was really kind of a different chapter of the Jewish life because it was the Jewish presence um, is relatively new and modest in numbers, uh, in not only in Beijing but also all across China, really. And unlike the deeply rooted communities of Europe or the vibrant enclaves of uh, in the United States in Baltimore, the Jewish population in Beijing is composed largely of a um, uh, small uh, small number of immigrants and um, even Chinese scholars with their academic interests in Jewish studies. And really at the for forefront of this cultural exchange is the Peking University, which introduced the first Yiddish class in China ever uh, in 2022. It was really a milestone signifying the growing, growing interest in Jewish culture within China. And this initiative was led by Professor Yang Meng, who really uh, lights up a pass for Yiddish in Beijing. It was really an, uh, in an unexpected landscape. And also while the historical Jewish community in Beijing was uh, were sparse, today's community uh, it was uh, bolstered by the support like institutions like uh, Kehillat uh, Beijing, which was founded in uh, 1979. And um, city is really now a uh, witness of the early stages of uh, the Jewish cultural revival. But I feel like it kind of also reflects a global trend of reconnection with Yiddish heritage all, all around the, um, the world. And uh, although Beijing's Jewish story is still at the beginning stage in, in, in infancy, um, the seeds of cultural preservation and revival have been planted. And we have reasons to believe that it's going to continue to grow. And um, this is a picture of uh, um, Chabad in, um, in Beijing, although it was no longer um, it was uh, no longer in use. And from my experiences and the cities themselves, in the expression and existence of Yiddish language and culture, um, I we could see that cultural and language revival is really an intricate process, and it involves not only the relearning or reintroduction of a language also the re-energizing of a community's collective memory. And this uh, revival is deeply connected with, uh, to the educational institutions, um, who, which play a really important and crucial role in providing uh, the resources and platforms needed for language and cultural study. And uh, in terms of community dynamics, the revival effort can be seen as a responses to, uh, can be seen as the response to the silences. Um, the historical period where language and culture was suppressed or just faded or just never existed in, um, in Beijing. And these efforts really uh, reflect uh, resistance to cultural loss and an embrace of diversity as well. It also uh, highlights the importance of education in fostering understanding and respect for different cultural identities. And from an anthropological perspective, something that I noticed was the concept of uh, language ideology and creolization, creolization. And here, um, language ideology really refers to the beliefs and feelings 
that people have about languages as used in their social worlds, which uh, have a positive uh, impact on the revival of Yiddish language. And it is more about uh, recognizing the value of every language as a carrier of culture. And for creolization, it refers to the modern uh, merging of historical Jewish culture with contemporary practices and uh, forms and ways of education and learning in diverse societies. And I believe that finding the voice is, is an act of cultural preservation to maintain the link between past and present. And it is an acknowledgement that each language with its unique worldview and capacity to convey a culture's heart and soul deserves to be heard and to be passed on to the, to the next generation. And this voice is more than just uh, uh, the literal sound. It's more like uh, it's more of the embodiment of the people's history, struggles, triumphs, and uh, the ongoing narratives.